So without further ado, please welcome Pierre Shelgren. So good morning. I guess it's still morning. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is, I mean, basically two things. One is the impact of global logistics strategies and the change in there. And then also how that impacts supply chain management on location decisions and as part of that I will also talk about how we as a company work uh, with uh, competitiveness modeling. Uh, GLDP is a team that is purpose built with and from that perspective we are a bit different than many other firms in our makeup because we have expertise from a lot of different areas. We know supply chain management, we know business intelligence, we know economic development, transportation asset management, including ports, rail, intermodal airports, uh, and inland ports. We know infrastructure evaluation and planning, project financing, and we have also been involved in uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, you have Adam's background in, in the presentation. Uh, my background is a little bit different, but at the same time fairly similar, in that I have been working in the logistics industry quite a lot. I used to run a container leasing company that I grew from a Scandinavian company to a company with presence in the East-West trade. I've been working for Citibank, uh, doing investments in transportation equipment, and I've been working in the private equity industry for uh, infrastructure funds, making investment in uh, ports, terminals, distribution centers, and I've been running some of the companies in that firm, for example, inland distribution in Holland and Belgium, and uh, some ports that we acquired here in the United States. Let's see. So the impact of global logistics strategies on location decisions is driven by change in, in underlying demand. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and also changes in the infrastructure, as for example, new rails, canals, airports, uh, and then ports, or also policy shifts, uh, as for example, new taxes on trucks and diesel, uh, to move cargo to, from roads to rail, uh, emotional decisions. Uh, I heard earlier here someone talked about how is, uh, it was set up a company in uh, upstate New York and they, a foreign investment company, and they did that because he went to school to Ithaca. So it, it, it's, it's a lot of decisions that are part of, of how we set this up and how we work with it. Um, so uh, so and, and we often don't really think about all the changes that we have seen over the last 200 years in, in, in transportation infrastructure. For example, we have, I mean, early canals, the Erie Canal that was built 200, over 200 years ago, and what that did to grow the trade in New York City and how it established New York City as a base that it still is today for trade around the world. Uh, the railroad and, and what that did for building the West and making transportation easy, the, the, the Suez Canal, how it cut back the road from Asia to Europe and how easy trade all of a sudden became when you didn't have to uh, sail around Africa. 
we have the Panama Canal, which was, of course, I mean, from the very beginning, a, a military decision from the U.S. Uh, Navy to be able to transport ships between uh, the Pacifics and 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 the uh, the uh, the Atlantics. But what that has done to Panama and what it has done to, 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 to the trade over the years. And we have, of course, I mean, the 30 last years, what is happening in the, in the containerization and what is going on right now with the extension of the Panama Canal, the new connections via Prince Rupert on railroad that is cutting down on transportation time from Asia to um, to 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 uh, um, United States and Canada and mostly in the Midwest, uh, and and we have the growing ships. I mean, they have gone from being uh, maximum 8,000 TUs 10, 15 years ago. Now they are up to 20,000 TUs. That is going to impact at some point in time. That is going to impact how they are shipped, how they are transported, and how they are transshipped. And that is also going to have an impact on the transportation chains. Oh, I did, f yeah, no, no, I'm on the right one, okay. So the global container trade is, as you can see from this um, chart, predominantly an uh, east-west trade and the charts illustrate clearly how the impact of the canals that we were talking about, how is that changed, how people are, uh, are, are moving goods. I mean, it's, uh, and you can see the, the circles there in, in, in green, they are, I mean, nudes or areas where you have confluence of, in, of, of shipping lanes coming in together. And with bigger ships, that is probably going to change how things are, are transported. Panama, for example, you have around 120 lines moving around in that area. And with the bigger Panama Canal, that could impact how people are transshipping. They have huge transshipment capacities there. You can uh, take, I mean, you can go from 4,500 TU to 10,000 TU when the new canal is, is opening. So it, it is going to provide a lot of opportunities. As it is today, if you look on the, uh, the, the, the routing that, that people are, are, are doing, you have I mean, three possibilities. You can do di go directly to the West Coast from China in 12 days. You can go uh, via the Panama Canal in 25 days. And you can go via the Suez Canal in 32 days. And there has been a change over the last couple of years from the West Coast to the East Coast. I think it is around 5 or 10% of cargo that has been moved. Uh, basically uh, to, to, to the other uh, coast. And you have seen a peak during last year because of the conflicts on the west coast, the difficulties in the ports. But although we see a, a bit, bit shift because that distribution companies want to make sure that they have secure distribution chains, that you always can get the, your, your cargo in time, regardless of what's happening in the world. So they're hedging the beds a little bit. But you also see today that cargo is moving back to the West Coast, and people tend to forget what happened. It doesn't take too long time, because it's still the most convenient way of doing it. This could, of course, change, especially if you look on uh, uh, on, on the map and you assume that uh, uh, transportation is going or production is going to change from uh, China to Southeast Asia and perhaps also to India as we heard earlier this morning that will make the Suez Canal much more efficient much more competitive and that will also have a an impact on how we distribute cargo This is just to show a little bit where where the import and export is in, in the different locations. And if you look on 
This is in value, so it's not in, in, in volume, because if it had been volume, the ports would have been much, much bigger than, than the airports. But uh, it, it also shows that, that most ports, especially the big ports, both on the East Coast and the West Coast, have a fairly large imbalance in the trade, in the value of the trade. They are filling up containers going back to, to Asia with whatever they can, they can find, while the airport still is charging for the, the cargo. So they have a much better balance in, uh, in, in, in the trade from a value perspective than, than they have if you are looking at, at, the, uh, at, at the shipping side. Some ports uh, have a very good balance in uh, also, uh, and you see that, for example, in Baltimore and in Norfolk, there are two ports that has very good balance because they have a lot of exports, they have a lot of cars, they have a lot of heavy machinery that goes out to Europe uh, from there. So, so that's uh, that's basically. But we have, as I think we talked about earlier today, uh, as well, there is an imbalance in the trade. And the country is suffering from, from that from a financial perspective. But we hope it's going to be better, right? Near sourcing and different, more, more direct foreign, foreign investment into the country. So this is basically the same map that we saw earlier from on the seaside. But this is on the, the air cargo side. And the only difference is that you see here um, inland locations that are, are huge. You see Chicago coming up as a, as a big hub for getting cargo into the Midwest because it starts to be competitive, it starts to be easier uh, to do so. But you also see quite a lot of, of changes. If you look at, at Dubai there, for example, that sits in the middle, and, and that has grown very much over the last couple of years. It's, of course, because the Emirates, the airline there, is flying wide-body aircrafts, taking a lot of cargo on passenger flights. But it's also being used as, uh, as a tool in, in supply chain management. And that's why it's becoming in, in, increasingly in, important and, and, and growing more complex in the global economy. So, for example, if you launch a new product in Europe, a high-tech product that is losing a lot of value as you, as you ship it, just by, I mean, the time lag, what a lot of distribution companies or manufacturers do is that they fly in the first batch. They put, because they wanted to get it out as quick as possible when you have the launch, you put a lot of supply on ships as well because it's much cheaper to do that. But you also introduce a third alternative, which is, you could call it the Dubai alternative or whatever you want. But somewhere down the road, you have an opportunity to change from shipping to air freight. So if the demand is going up more than you expect, you will drop off containers in Dubai. They will take them and put them in aircraft and fly them over to Europe. So that's how you save a lot of time. And Dubai has also been building, a, not only do they have the big passenger airport, they have also built a big cargo airport next to the port. So in a couple of hours, you can get a containers, container into the foreign trade zone, off a ship, and over to the airport and load it. So that's, that's, that's an interesting part on how supply chain management is affecting how people are transporting, where it goes, and how it goes. Because when all of a sudden you can start to break up the containers and send it out to many countries uh, uh, from, 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 from Dubai. <coughs> so if you, uh, if, we, if, you, if you look on trends, and I mean, out, this outsourcing has become more and more sophisticated. Uh, critical components might be manufactured in several locations, sent to another continent for further assembly, and then perhaps to a third or fourth place to, to be consumed or be used. So 
that is something that, that is, is continuing to, to, to grow, and I will talk about a few examples a little bit later that is addressing, I mean, w w what is happening. Sea cargo will need to be interchangeable with both trucks and rail, and as we talked about earlier, you can also interchange that with flights when it fits well in, into your uh, transportation uh, chain. So what do you ship by air? I mean, obviously, do you ship high-value cargo and critical components to uh, replacements for industrial applications if an industry goes down? It, it's, we, we have also the equipment and the evaluation of, uh, or uh, and the environmental impact on, on, uh, on what we do and how we transport things. Planes are getting more environmentally friendly. Uh, more adapted to intermodal change or intermodal use because as it is not right now you can hardly you can ha hardly transship from airplane to airplane because the configurations are different so it's much more point to point but you can probably in the future see for high value cargo getting more transshipments and that's what the integrator uh, graders do it's also important to you see port-centric requirements and port-centric uh, de developments because the ports are developing so quickly right now. They are be becoming so big and they're taking so big ships that you will see that you will need to change how you handle the cargo out of the port, out of the port area. And that's another trend that we see very clearly. So we talked about, I mean, change, example of changes. Two of the industries that are very obvious is the automotive industry and the pharma in industry. The automotive industry see a true global growth. And ready-made vehicles are, I mean, shipped around the world on roll-on, roll-off vessels. But components for these vehicles come from all over the world. So, I mean, it's most of the car might be manufactured in three, four, five, or even 10 countries, and then assembled somewhere else, just because it, 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 it makes economic sense. And, and you also see that, I mean, with, uh, and, 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 and you also see that, that the technology that is coming into car is also changing the way that, that things are shipped. And the pharma is similar, it's global sourcing, it's cold storage requirements, it's customizing of drugs, depending on, 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 on the, where, where you are. And that is also something that is driving growth in, uh, in, 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 in uh, airline industry quite a lot, or in airline like cargo. So the second one in part I'm going to talk about, it is our uh, it, it is our modeling, how we work with uh, economic development agencies and companies in order to find either the right customer or the right location. So, we always, uh, when we start modeling, uh, for, for, for a client, we, we look at two overall decision factors. One is transportation economies, economics and, and land economics. Well, and the challenge is to customize and, and, and break down the components to arrive to a total landed cost at the same time as you understand the trends, where things are going, where the industry trends are, so you don't make a lot of investments for an industry that is going to change within a couple of years and then all of a sudden you sit there with an empty warehouse or em empty locations. So uh, that, that, that is very, very, very uh, important and I'm going to talk a little bit more and talk about the, 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 the details here. So what we look at, it is, I mean, we look at the routes, how is the cargo coming to the location? We look at the time it takes because that's also very important, depending on the value of the cargo and how it fits into production or uh, distribution. 
we look at competition, we look at reliability in the supply chain, we look at the cost, and we look at the, the service levels. We also look at the land economics, the cost of land, the cost of buildings, labor, taxation, regulatory restrictions and risk factors. I mean, if you need something where you have good weather all, all, all year around, you should probably not place it in the Pacific Northwest. If you need something that has nice summer or a nice, nice winter, you shouldn't put it in the Northeast. It's, it's just a matter of fact. But you have to take that into your considerations when you do uh, and, and develop um, your, your, your customer base. So, so this is what we do. Our, our, our model and the way we work is it's, it's a proprietary model that we have built ourselves as a company. What we do is that we, we, we customize this model together uh, with each client and no model will like, look exactly the same. So what we do is that we, we put in all these different sectors or groups as we talked about uh, earlier and we try to weigh them and, and put an importance to them as depending on where they are, what, what, what the clients want, want to do. And, and we apply that to the different locations that they are contemplating. I mean, it might be some reasons for a company to say that, yeah, we are thinking about the three, four or five different locations. And then you do that for, uh, for them. So you compare these locations and, and the different factors that is affecting uh, the, the decision. If we work for an economic development firm, we do this a little, uh, the other way around. So instead of having Winnipeg, Toronto, Seattle up there, we will have different target companies, so diff different target industries that we are, uh, are looking at and see how they fit into the location and what, 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 what the uh, company is, is offering. The next slide is the same thing, it's just the other kind of factors that we, we put in into such uh, uh, consideration. And as I also wanted to, to show you, this is a live example of what uh, of one of our client and what we do for, for this client. This is a job we have in Merced where we work for, for Merced to help them to develop industries in and around an old Air Force base. Merced is in California. And what we, this is a Midwest US based uh, company who wants to uh, access key West Coast and, 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 and being able to better serve Asia. So they make machineries that they export or sell. And, and, and the land that they needed to have 30,000 square foot, 70 employees could get there. And they have expansion plans and are willing to invest a lot of money. The raw material comes from the Midwest most of the time. So, uh, and, and uh, the, the production destination or product destination is 75% US and Canada and 25% Asia. So you would mean think that a Midwest location might be the best for, 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 for them. But the, what we have done here it is that we have, together with them, have weighed all these different components, as I talked about earlier, and the higher number you have, the better it is. But as this is real examples, I mean, the numbers come out pretty close. So it, it's not going to be one location is not going to be 10 and the rest are going to be three. Then there is something wrong. So, so well, what we do is, is that we compare this, I mean, from a cost perspective, and we compare it from a time in transit, or reliability and business and environment, and so on and so forth. And we come to uh, a kind of a tot total or index for different locations. You can then, of course, talk to them and talk through, okay, why is 
one location, for example, renal scoring low on reliability. Is that something we can change? Is that something you can work on? And then you together come, come up with a final solution. I mean, what is the best uh, location really for, for what you do, depending on how important it is to have it now or to get it in a couple of months or half a year or whatever it takes to train people to get it done. But this is basically how we are working together with our clients in order to get them the best possible location or the best, the most suitable company. So the keys for the future are, I mean, what I, I would assume is, is uh, quite fundamental. It is to understand the, the competitiveness of a site for economic development agencies. What can we com compete for? We cannot compete for everything because there, there are always other locations that have at least the same uh, advantages. We cannot, we, we want to be sure that we understand what, what our competitiveness is. We, we, we must be aware of the logistic environment, how easy or difficult it is to get things from or to this place. Uh, and we, 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 we need to be focused on, 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 on the proposition-based business development. So we really know what, is, what are we looking for. For the corporation, it's, I mean, the same thing, but it's a little bit uh, on the other side of the, of the coin. It is, we talk about, I mean, we need to, uh, they need to advise government partners about supply chain needs. They cannot really take for granted that everybody is understanding what they need in order to get uh, cargo there and what is needed in order to support it. So they need to talk to them. There need to be a dialogue. They, and, and, and this is, is, is very, very important. And, and, uh, it is important to streamline and rationalize the, 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 the supply chain. So these are the points I wanted to, to, to communicate and talk a little bit about. I'm happy to take questions, having a dialogue if we have time, and I guess we do have a little bit of time. So if there are any questions, I'm all yours. Okay. I'm not so sure that uh, that any of the ports that it's I'm not so sure it's going to change very much especially not in the short term. I mean one of the reasons is of course that the low oil prices you have and the situation you have in the shipping industry so it is as it is today the the the, the charter for a ship a, a small ship is beneficial, so you can keep on running your small ships. And so I'm not so sure the market is going to change in the way that it was anticipated in the first uh, uh, place. So, and I think that most of the cargo that wants to go to the East Coast has already gone to the East Coast. So I'm not so sure the Panama Canal is going to have that much of an impact. If the current liner operators decide to go to bigger ships, it will only affect the number of calls. So they will run the same number of containers in bigger ships. That will have an impact on the inland side and how you, you, how you continue to transport it, but it will not change the dynamic that much. Yep. I mean, you are you are much younger than I am, so I wouldn't say in, not in my lifetime, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but perhaps in yours. Of course, it it it, it is it is uh, closer, right? So, but it all depends. As I said earlier, when we looked already today, a lot of people are shipping via the Suez Canal to the U.S. East Coast, and it's much longer. Than, than the other way. It depends on what type of cargo it is and what, uh, what the shipping lines decide to, to make. They just want to compete and get the best product. They're just uh, delivering a product to the supply chain. 
that is called shipping. It's just a part of it. It's, you have to think about the full, 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 from manufacturer to consumption. You have to think about the full, full change. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but I think it has a long way to go. Uh, it should be for, perfect for a lot of locations, of course, but not in my lifetime. Anything else? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the new Silk Road initiative um, to link up China with Europe? Do you think it's overhyped or can it really fundamentally change logistics corridors? I have my doubts. I have my doubts. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the Silk Road is, of course, it depends on how the economies are growing on the Silk Road and in what way you can start to transport things because that's a rail connection. You already have a rail connection from Europe to Asia where the Trans-Siberian Railroad and that works, <laughs> hasn't really been that successful because of pricing issues and, and I mean it's, it's, it's always very very difficult to make something work and I haven't seen any economic calculations based on that. I don't know what the assumptions are. It sounds to me like a political thing. And so people will continue to talk about it. But how are you going and where are you going to do it? I know that they talk about getting into Georgia. But how do you take it from Georgia? Then you have to ship it from there, which is far in into the Black Sea. So. Have you gained anything? I, I, I cannot say, but I think it is, it is like you have all these highways, to you, you, make, you draw lines on a map, and you think this is going to happen, and it doesn't because water always falls to the lowest point, and it's about economics, transit times, and, and arbitration in between there. So if they can find a quicker, more economic way by using this, by all means it will work. Otherwise, it will not. This is a, there's the same question for the canal if the Chinese are building in Nicaragua. Do you believe that's actually feasible? Well, it's, it's, again, it's an economic decision. If China has money, which I don't think that they have today, to build something like that, it's a big project. They could, of course, get a lot of, I mean, what is called um, one way, one road. No, it's one. One belt run, one road, yeah. And, and if they might have a very different view on what economics is, because if that keeps them going, they keep up Chinese production of steel and, 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 and uh, I mean, components for, for doing that, they could pr probably build it. I'm not so sure it's going to be economical. And the latest I heard is that it's very much up in the air. I th if you asked me one year ago, I would say it would probably be built, just because people build these kind of things. It's the way you build the, 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 the rail tunnel from England to, to France. It's cost prohibitive, but it's a great connection. So nowadays, no one is thinking about it. You have taken your losses, and people start to make money. You start to transport cargo. You look into to changing the supply chain within Europe again by, by having, using fast trains between London and, and the big airports on the continent as well. So, I mean, people build this. It's, we wouldn't have the uh, interstate roads if it wasn't for... Uh, a good idea, I mean, to build something that you don't get back economically in the short time. I mean, you cannot really make an economic calculation that makes it work. But out of some other reason, people do it. And that's a part of the development and the evolution we see. So, uh, yes, I think someone could build it, because, but not because it's a, good, it, it's, it's a great economic idea to do it from a transportation perspective, but it could be for a country or for companies to be able to sustain steel production. It's, a, it's another way for China to dump steel into the market. Right now they do it by ships and they do it by containers. They just sell them at half the price that they were going for two years ago.
Anything else? All right. Thank you.